Hello, I'm very happy to be here uh, speaking to you today, <clears throat> particularly uh, with connection to my book, An Odyssey, Un Odyssea, because I'm devoted my entire career as a writer really to um, thinking of ways to connect the classical literature, which is my own field of study professionally, uh, to, um, to life as we live it. I'm always asking myself the question, as somebody who studied classics uh, and did a doctorate in classics and I teach classics, I'm always asking myself the question, why does this literature continue to speak to us today? You know, at least here in the United States, there can be an attitude that the classics is a kind of medicine that's good for you. And even though it may not taste so good, we must take it. Uh, it I feel, however, that the great texts of classical literature continue to be relevant and continue to speak to us because they tell us things that are true about life. And, you know, I'm always asked in interviews uh, and uh, when I write articles and people respond, you know, why should we still be reading the Iliad, the Odyssey, the plays of Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides? Why should we be reading these works that are 2,000 years old, 2,500 years old, 3,000 years old today when the world is so different and technology is so different and our problems are so different? And my answer is always that everything may be different, but one thing that has never changed is human nature. Human nature is always the same since the beginning of time. And that's why these works, even though they're extremely old, continue to tell us things that are true. I myself uh, did uh, graduate work in Greek and Latin. I ended up writing a dissertation about Greek tragedy, but I was always um, had as mentors uh, people who were uh, scholars of Homer, uh, particularly the Odyssey. And for this reason, I became very involved in the Odyssey uh, professionally, you might say. Uh, my first uh, great professor when I was an undergraduate at the University of Virginia uh, was a scholar called Jenny Strauss Clay, the daughter of Leo Strauss, the great uh, philosopher and uh, classicist himself. She was a scholar of the Odyssey. Then I went to graduate school and I started taking classes uh, with a scholar called Froma Zeitlin, who is also a scholar of the Odyssey. And so the Odyssey was always swirling around my life. But even before then, as a child, I began to read the Odyssey when I was about 11 or 12 years old and I first became interested in Greek mythology. I think young people in particular are attracted to the Odyssey because it has this aspect of a sort of science fiction tale. It's about this hero who is uh, stranded far from home. He has these encounters with uh, monsters and uh, aliens, strange kinds of people who belong to different civilizations. And I think that part of the Odyssey appeals to young children. And I have a very clear memory of reading the Odyssey when I was about 11 or 12 and thinking that this was going to be part of my life. And indeed, it ended up being part of my life. Uh, so the book that I'm talking about today, uh, which is called An Odyssey, A Father, A Son, and An Epic, is, I hope, an example of this thing that I believe in, which is that we can use these texts of classical culture to think about our own lives. In my case, I had a rather uh, strange experience uh, about now just under 10 years ago which is that uh, I am a professor at a small university in New York called Bard College. 
uh, about two hours north of New York City in the countryside. And in the spring semester of 2011, I was teaching a seminar to first year university students about the Odyssey. And this is a course that runs for 16 weeks. The class meets once a week for two and a half to three hours. And we usually take two books at a time and we read them in advance and we discuss them. In this particular class, uh, my father, who was then 81 years old, decided that he wanted to be my student. My father was a scientist. Uh, he was trained as a mathematician. He was a rather difficult person in many ways, a sort of grumpy, um, crusty uh, man. He had grown up quite poor in New York City uh, during the Depression. He worked very hard to educate himself. He eventually uh, was doing a PhD himself uh, in mathematics uh, and ended up working his entire life at an aerospace corporation as a research scientist. So we were quite different uh, one to another, as you can imagine. He was very scientific, very mathematical, not at all emotional. Um, uh, very reserved, very much a man of his era. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, was a literature person. I was interested in the arts, in literature. I was uh, always studying languages. Um, and I really must say that until I was in my late 20s, I didn't really get along that well with my father. Uh, not so much that we were having difficulties, but I never felt very close to him. And then when I went to graduate school, he started softening up a little because he liked the idea that I was doing a PhD. He was very interested in academic achievement. Um, and I think he approved of the fact that I had decided to take classics at a very high level uh, and become a professor, which to him was very important. As I said, uh, he himself was quite poor when he grew up. Uh, his parents were immigrants to the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, his grandmother, my great grandmother, did not even know how to read or write. So for my father, it was quite uh, a great accomplishment for the family to think that uh, his son could become a professor of classics. It was the great American success story. Uh, and so we start, our, the relations between us began to thaw uh, as I got older. He himself had always been very interested in the classics, even though he was a scientist and particularly a mathematician. When he was young uh, in school and then in high school, he had been very good in Latin. Uh, and as uh, if any of the people in this audience are teachers, uh, you may be aware that there's usually quite a high correlation between uh, ability in mathematics and ability in Latin for some reason. So my father was a great Latin student and he was a great math student. But of course, he never continued with the Latin. And I think for that reason, he was particularly happy that I went on to study the classics. So now, here we are in January of 2011. And one night before the uh, university term began, my phone rang and it was my father on the other end. And he said, what are you teaching this semester? And I said, well, I'm teaching the Odyssey of Homer. And he said, you know, I think I want to take your class. I was a little surprised and I said, why? He said, well, you know, I used to like the classics and now I'm in my 80s. I don't know how much time I have left. Maybe." it would be interesting to go back to the Odyssey, which I have not read since I was in high school in the 1940s. So that was the beginning of a great adventure, which turned out to be the final adventure of his life. What happened was in uh, the beginning of 2011, he took my course, he drove up, uh, from the suburbs of New York, where he and my mother live, uh, up to the countryside, where the little university is, where I teach, 
once a week. He took part in the class and he um, was my student, which was a very peculiar experience, which I describe in my book. But during that 16 weeks when he was my student, I began to see things about my father in his reactions to the text of the Odyssey that were very revealing for me. The way that he reacted to the text of Homer showed things about him that I never really knew before. And I write about this experience in the book. And that experience of teaching my father, having him in my course, watching him interact with my students, which was often quite comical, they were first year university students, 17 and 18 years old. And here's this grouchy 81 year old man sitting in the corner. Um, and that was quite an experience. When the semester was over in May of 2011, a friend of ours, in fact, this uh, graduate school mentor of mine, Froma Zeitlin, a great classic scholar, told me that she had heard about a cruise that recreated the voyages of Odysseus, Ulysse. And I thought, we should go on this cruise. So I called my father and he said, let's do it. So we went on this cruise. And during the course of this cruise, which was 10 days, where we sailed around the Mediterranean, recreating the voyages of Odysseus, it was another revelatory experience for me because I saw, I began to understand things about the Odyssey I had never understood before. You know, as many people know, even if they have not read the Odyssey, it is about travel. It is about a man who spends 10 years trying to get home to his wife and his child. But in those 10 years, he has a remarkable series of adventures that expose him to new cultures, new kinds of people, new civilizations, some good, some bad. And I began to appreciate something about the Odyssey I had never really understood before, which is the essential um, uh, irony of the Odyssey is that Odysseus has been gone for 20 years by the time he reaches home in Ithaca. And he has to prove to the people who have been waiting for him that he is the same man who left. He has to prove his identity, which of course one has to remember. This is, you know, long before photo identification and DNA tests. So it raises the question, how do you prove who you are? And the, the poem ends, as many people know, with him finally being recognized by his wife and his uh, child and his household and reestablished in his household. But the irony is that no one can be the same after 20 years of being away and suffering and having extraordinary experiences. So the Odyssey hinges on a very strange irony, which is that at the moment he has to prove who he is, one is also aware that he has to be completely different after all this time. And that's what I started to understand during this cruise when there was something about this voyage that we took together that revealed to me aspects of my father's personality that I had never really been able to see before. We, when I was growing up, we didn't really take many vacations. I very rarely had a chance to see my father relaxing and having fun. He was working all the time when I was growing up. And so I, I was very moved by the fact that during this cruise, uh, recreating the voyages of Odysseus, I myself was having this amazing transformative experience with travel, watching my father uh, expand and relax and become, so to speak, a different version of himself. And the cruise, uh, one could say, is a sort of second act of this story. And the final act, uh, unfortunately, is that <clears throat> Soon after we returned from the Mediterranean to New York, uh, my father had an accident um, and uh, 
as a result of this uh, quite minor accident, uh, he ended up suffering a stroke and uh, three months later he died. And so after that, I looked back on what had turned out to be the last year of my father's life and saw that the entire year had been refracted, so to speak, through the Odyssey of Homer. First through the course that he took and then through the cruise that we went on. And that is really the story of my book. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the specific experiences that I had, uh, which shed light on this way in which the text of Homer really showed me things about the reality, the emotional reality of my life and my father's life. Um, but before I do that, I'd just like to read to you a little bit from the beginning of the book to give you a sense of the style and the tone of the book, because one of the things that I do in the book is I have constructed the structure of the book in the way that Homer constructs the Odyssey. Uh, one of the features of Homer's compositional technique is something called ring composition, which is a way of telling a story where one begins to tell a story, let's call it story A. And as you're telling story A, you realize that you need to give some background that will help illuminate story A. And so you, you interrupt yourself and start telling story B. Story B is the backstory of story A. And it could be the case that while you're telling story B, you think of a further story that might help people understand story B, and so you start telling story C. And ring composition is a sort of a series of embedded tales, but at the end you circle back from story C to story B to story A. And by the time you're back in story A, you have all this additional information and narrative that helps enrich your appreciation of the primary story. And this is, in fact, how I wrote my book as a kind of imitation of Homer's style. I'm going to read to you now just for a few minutes to um, give you a sense of what the book feels like. And then I'm going to discuss a few particular instances uh, about what happened with me and my father and reflect a little about the way that Homer helped me to understand. So this uh, is just the first few pages of the book. You don't need to know anything. There's no, um, there's no setup involved. This is just how the book begins. One January evening, a few years ago, just before the beginning of the spring term in which I was going to be teaching an undergraduate seminar on the Odyssey, my father, a retired research scientist who was then aged 81, asked me for reasons I thought I understood at the time if he might sit in on the course, and I said yes. Once a week for the next 16 weeks, he would make the trip between the house and the Long Island suburbs where I grew up, a modest split level in which he still lived with my mother, to the Riverside campus of the small college where I teach, which is called Bard. At 10 past 10 each Friday morning, he would take a seat among the freshmen who were enrolled in the course, 17 or 18 year olds, not even a quarter his age, and join in the discussion of this old poem, an epic about long journeys and long marriages and what it means to yearn for home. It was deep winter when that term began. And when my father wasn't trying to persuade me that the poem's hero, Odysseus, wasn't in fact a real hero, because he would say he's a liar and he cheated on his wife, my father was worrying a great deal about the weather, the snow on the windshield, the sleet on the roads, the ice on the walkways. He was afraid of falling, he said his vowels still marked by his childhood in the Bronx. Falling, he would say. 
Because of his fear of falling, we would make our way gingerly along the narrow asphalt paths that led to the building where the class met, a brick box as studiedly inoffensive as a Marriott hotel, or up to the little walkway to the steep gabled house at the edge of campus that for a few days each week was my home. To avoid having to make the three hour trip twice in one day, he would often spend the night in that house, sleeping in the extra bedroom that serves as my study, stretched out on a narrow day bed that had been my childhood bed, a low wooden bed that my father built for me with his own hands when I was old enough to leave my crib. Now there was something about this bed that only my father and I knew. It was made out of a door, a cheap hollow door to which he had screwed four sturdy wooden legs, securing them with metal brackets that are as solidly attached today as they were 50 years ago when he first joined the steel to the wood. This bed, with its amusing little secret, unknowable unless you hauled off the mattress and saw the paneled door beneath, was the bed on which my father would sleep that spring semester of the Odyssey seminar, not long before he became ill and my brothers and sister and I had to start fathering our father, anxiously watching him as he slept fitfully in a series of enormous, elaborately mechanized contraptions that hardly seemed like beds at all whirring noiseless, noisily as they inclined and declined like cranes. But that came later. The Odyssey course ran from late January to early May. A week or so after it ended, I happened to be on the phone with my friend, friend Froma, a classic scholar who had been my mentor in graduate school and had lately enjoyed hearing my periodic report about my father's progress over the course of the Odyssey seminar. At some point in the conversation, she mentioned a Mediterranean cruise that she had taken a couple of years before called Retracing the Odyssey. You should do it, Froma exclaimed. After this semester, after teaching the Odyssey to your father, how could you not go? Not everyone agreed. When I emailed a travel agent friend of mine, a brisk blonde Ukrainian called Yelena, to ask her what she thought, her response came back within a minute. Avoid theme cruises at all costs. But Froma had been my teacher, and I was still in the habit of obeying her. The next morning, when I called my father and told him about my conversation with her, he made a noncommittal so noise and said, let's see. And that was the beginning of our great adventure. So already you can tell just from these pages some of the key themes of the book. The connection with my father, um, the nature of teaching. You know, he's going to be a student in my class. I get the idea for the cruise from my teacher, whom I still feel like I need to obey, and that the Germans have when a German graduate student refers to her uh, advisor, uh, they call it a doctor father, a doctor father. And so there's something about the, the nature of the teacher-student relationship that is almost parental, which is recognized in this German term, and I'm so interested in that. And of course, the model in my case was complicated by the fact that my father was my student. Um, also, uh, in those pages, you hear something about the allure of travel, uh, the, the idea that travel can be problematic, my funny tra travel agent friend warning me not to take a theme cruise, um, and uh, my father's fear of falling, which I mentioned very casually in that opening uh, section. It was winter, as I said, he was always afraid of slipping on the ice um, where I teach is uh, in the north and it's quite cold here. And in fact, the accident that ultimately proved to be fatal was in fact uh, a fall. 
so that unfortunately came true. And uh, in the um, epics of ancient Greece, the opening part of the epic is called the Proem, uh, which, in which the poet of this very long work announces his themes. And the pages I just read you, I call in my book, the Proem. You get my father, um, you get the theme of travel, of teaching, and a slight hint of his fall and his ultimate death. One of the things that becomes very important in the narrative of my book and having to do with the theme of teaching is the fact, and it's almost one could say the punchline of the book, is that I could never persuade my father to like the Odyssey. To the bitter end, he really didn't like the Odyssey, which is the poem that may be the most important work from classical antiquity to myself. All through, the fir- all through the semester and starting from the very first day, he challenged me in the classroom. And it was very funny because, you know, when you teach, when you're teaching, uh, particularly undergraduates, uh, particularly first year undergraduates, it's a very delicate game that's played where you want to, as the professor, and in a sense, you need to establish your authority, establish the discipline of the classroom, And yet, on the other hand, you want to make the students uh, feel that they can speak in class and offer their opinion. So it's a very delicate balancing act. One, I must say, that was completely ruined uh, in this class by the presence of my father, who from the very beginning started arguing with me about my interpretations of Homer. And it sounds quite funny to say now, Uh, But it ended up being a very positive thing. And one of the things that I describe in this, uh, as it were, first act of my book is the the way in which my father was obviously a very intelligent man, but he was not schooled in literature. He was not a professional of literature. The way in which his own readings of the text made him, in fact, in some ways, a better teacher than I was because he approached the text completely fresh. He had his own responses. He trusted his opinions. So, for example, the, one of the great problems with the Odyssey as a text is the character of Odysseus. He is at once attractive, an adventurer, a hero, a swashbuckler, um, and yet He's deceptive, he lies all the time, and my father could never accept that Odysseus should be considered a hero. And you know, it's funny because when you're a writer, you always think that Odysseus is wonderful because he's a great storyteller. One of the ways that he's constantly getting out of difficult situations is he fabricates these lies, tall tales, stories uh, about himself, He's constantly pretending to be somebody else. So in a certain sense, Odysseus is the first writer in Western literature. Uh, And my father hated him. He couldn't stand him. And so from the very beginning of the class, my father and I were in conflict over the nature of the hero of this ancient Greek poem to which I have devoted my life, really, as as a classicist and as a writer. Um, And that was very instructive for the students. Normally, first-year students are very timid. um, And I think the the fact that my father was always arguing with me in the classroom uh, emboldened my students to be more independent-minded than they might otherwise (laughs) have been. Um, So that's a major theme of the book, sort of how at first it was incredibly irritating to me to have my father always interrupting me and saying I was wrong and I was interpreting the poem wrongly. (laughs) You know, it was kind of every professor's nightmare. He was the sort of worst student you could imagine. And yet it ended up being more challenging for me. And it made me think harder about the poem because of the way in which he challenged my interpretations, it made me really think harder about the Odyssey than I had ever thought before. And I've taught it many times over the years. Uh, And that can be a problem because when you teach something very often, you get into a kind of groove 
Um, and that can be a danger. You stop losing your freshness. So I really feel uh, belatedly that I learned a lot from my father and became a better teacher um, than I would have been if he had not been there, even though at the time I found it very irritating. <laughs> Um, so that's one of the major themes of the book. And I, I, I would say in closing that uh, the other great theme of the book is the transformational power of travel, which is, of course, a theme of the Odyssey itself. I mentioned before how much I learned about my father from traveling with him. As I mentioned, he grew up poor. He didn't have any luxury in his early life. And like many uh, people of his generation, he was born in 1929, just before the Great Depression began. Uh, he was a child of the Depression. He was always very reluctant to spend money because he was always haunted by the possibility that it might all disappear. And it was very moving for me to see him on this very luxurious cruise for the first time in his life sort of um, unwinding. And, you know, on the crew, when I was growing up, he was very rough with us, not physically, but, you know, he was gruff. He, as I said, he wasn't emotional. He'd never hugged us, you know. Uh, he'd never, you know, expressed a lot of emotion. And so I thought of him my whole life as a sort of a hard person. And then on the cruise, this sort of magical transformation began to take place, very much like these magical transformations <laughs> that keep happening in the Odyssey. He, he became relaxed. He was funny. Everybody liked him. You know, every night we would gather at the bar having cocktails. There was a piano bar. And he would sit there. You know, he was 81. He was the oldest person there. And a little group of people would gather around him and he would start reminiscing and telling stories from his childhood, things that he never did with us, his own children. And it was as if, I, you know, I remember people kept coming up to me during the course of the cruise and saying to me, oh, you know, your father is so charming. And I would say, my father is so charming. Are you kidding me? I never thought of my father as a charming person. But there was like the magic of the Mediterranean had started working on him. And, and he would sing songs that he liked. And I thought, this is really very much like what happens in the Odyssey. You know, there was something about just the fact of traveling that allowed him to be a version of himself that had never been permitted to exist before because of the circumstances of his life. And that gave me great insight also into the Odyssey. As I said, we got back from the cruise in the summer of 2011, and very soon after he tripped, fell, and that was the beginning of his end. And the final Odyssean lesson that I learned, as I said before, so much of the Odyssey is about this famous theme of recognition. He comes back to his own home, a stranger, he's in disguise. How can he prove to the people who knew him that he is still himself? And I'm sure anyone in the audience who has had a relative, a loved one, with a brain injury, a stroke, a coma, you are faced in a very strange and moving way with that very problem of recognition because you go to the hospital, there's this person lying in the bed, they can't speak, they can't open their eyes, you can't know if they know that you are there. And you have to ask yourself the question, is it still him? Is it still him? And I know that many people have been in that situation. And when I was in that situation, at the beginning of 2012, I thought again of the Odyssey and the questions that it asks about the nature of our relationship to our loved ones, how well we know them, and how in the end can they remain recognizable when so many other things have changed. 
And so I wanted to put before you today some of these considerations. Uh, you know, this isn't just uh, to uh, promote my book, but this is to get you to think about the way that some of these ancient works continue to raise questions that seem profoundly contemporary, however old the works may be. And in my book, An Odyssey, I tried to use the text of Homer to reflect upon a strange and wonderful experience that I was lucky enough to have almost 10 years ago with my late father. I hope you will get a chance to read my book, but even more, I hope you'll get a chance to return to the Odyssey and some of these other classics and to ask the question of what these works still have to say to us. As a great Italian writer once said, a classic is a book that never stops having something to say to us. And I think that's something that we should all think about. Thank you.